My name is Jessica Jang. I'm the education manager at Workman Arts. I'd like to welcome you to Resistant Bodies, the intersections of self and health panel. Workman Arts would like to acknowledge the Indigenous land on which we are presently located. Toronto comes from the Ganegeha word, Tekaranto, which can be translated as where the trees meet the water. It is part of traditional territories of many nations, the Hirwandat, the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Workman Arts recognizes this is an ongoing dialogue. We are grateful to live and work on this land with all people, those indigenous to Turtle Island and those from all over the world. Workman Arts values inclusivity, anti-oppression and safety at all levels. Everyone has a role to play in maintaining that spirit. Please see our full statement and code of conduct on our website and ensure that you are treating others with respect. If you would like to ask a question, and I very much recommend you do, um, please type it into the chat. I'll be keeping an eye out for your questions and we'll be um, answering your questions in the order that they come in. We'll reserve the last about 20 minutes of the panel to um, address your questions. And uh, we apologize in advance if we're not able to get to your questions in the allotted time. Um, please send them sooner rather than later because I've noticed that uh, with really exciting panels, um, we can't get to everything if you're asking questions in the last five minutes. We have um, our active listener, Rodrigo, joining us. If you need to step off the call, you can text him, or if you require support, please get in touch with them directly. Um, his contact information is on the webpage for our panel. We value making time to discuss difficult content at Rendezvous with Madness, but respect that you know your own limits and will seek out the kind of support you need if you require it. I would now like to introduce our panelists. Uh, we have, oh yes, and please panelists, when I say your name, just give the uh, lovely viewers a little wave so they're able to indicate who you are. Um, we have Rochelle Richardson, and she's a, a Canadian Caribbean multidisciplinary theater artist, writer, producer, and advocate for Black, queer, mentally ill, disabled communities. Rochelle is passionate about promoting and developing opportunities for Black artists and encouraging difficult conversations about intersectionality. Rochelle holds a BA in English and Theatre Studies from the University of Guelph and continues to pursue additional training with the GTA and Peel regions. Select companies and programs include Be Current for Playwriting, BC Hub, Buddies of Bad Times for Play Creation and Emerging Creators Unit, Nightwood's Young Innovators Program in Arts Administration and Producing, Peace of Mind Arts, Dance Immersion's Legacy Leaders Program, and more. For the Rebuilding Resilience exhibition, Rochelle has developed a performance called Queen Latifah Give Me Strength. This piece centers around a woman's struggle with her identity and her expectations of being disregarded and ignored by the medical industry. Next, we have Van Lisa, who is a trans-identified multidisciplinary artist and gender performer based in Toronto. Subjects explored in his, their work include trans health, AFAB, assigned female at birth experiences, toxic masculinity and riot girl politics and aesthetics. Van's interests are rooted in radical queer politics, namely the dismantling of white cis hetero patriarchy and the institutions it resides in. Um, due to renovations is an installation piece focusing on a trans masculine experience through casting techniques, the artist captured their transitioning body at different stages of their hormone replacement therapy. These casts are framed in a construction zone containing two video montages. The first filmed in 2015 before the artist identified as trans. The second filmed 11 months into the artist's HRT. Iveta Sun Young Kang is an interdisciplinary visual and video artist and writer currently based in Montreal. She studied film directing in South Korea and earned her MFA in film production at Concordia University. She has presented short films and videos at film festivals and galleries around the world, including in South Korea, Canada, Germany, and the United States. In 2016, Kang was shortlisted for the Simon Blaise Award in Canada. 
She recently published a poetry book entitled Absent Seats and is a co-founding member of the artist collective Quite Ourselves and the AV duo CCVX question mark. Tolerance of Uncertainty is an installation that combines a single channel video instruction to the ball measure and the ball in a fictional setting that resembles the interior of the a psychiatrist therapy session. This participatory work asks an audience to sit as a testee to assess the levels of their own anxiety. Winnipeg-born Sophie Dow is an emerging artist and music artist inspired by interdisciplinary collaboration and her Métis, Assiniboine, and Settler roots. An avid adventurer, Sophie has a passion for busking, yoga, and traveling on top of holding a specialized honors degree in dance performance and choreography from York University. Currently, Sophie is part of the Paprika Festival's Indigenous Arts Program, preparing for um, Adelaide's Re Research, I hope I said that correctly, and is an artistic associate of Camara Dance Theatre. She writes music, performs, and busks regularly throughout Ontario with her band, the Honeycomb Flyers, and is a practicing licensed holistic practitioner of traditional Thai massage. Mountain Duets is a ceremony illustrated through dance, music, and multimedia. An individual falls into a chaotic haze, losing sight of their balance and stillness. Calling upon ancestors of Turtle Island, they journey together, reminding us of our deep-rooted strength, resilience, and reciprocity to each other and to Mother Earth. And last but not least, I'm very uh, honored to present our moderator, who is Gloria C. Swain. Um, Gloria is a multidisciplinary Black mad artist, activist, and mental health advocate. Swain works with the mediums of installation, painting, performance, and photography. Her work challenges and connects intergenerational traumas to ongoing colonial violence and mental health. She has shown in Toronto, Manitoba, and Montreal. Swain holds a community art certificate and master's degree in environmental studies. So uh, welcome all you talented, wonderful people. Um, Gloria, feel free to take it away. Hi, can you hear me? Hi, it, uh, it's great to be here. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, and thank you so much to the amazing artists. All the work is amazing. Uh, before I start the questions, I just wanted to recap uh, the artist's work. Um, Aveda, uh, her installation uh, uses a ball to resemble the interior of a psychiatric therapy session. Uh, Van Lisa, uh, due to renovations, uses casting techniques to focus on a trans masculine experience of HRT, uh, hormone replacement therapy. Rochelle, Queen Latifah gives me strength. I saw the movie, an awesome movie. Um, centers around a woman's struggle for identity and her expectations of being disregarded and ignored by the medical in industry. I also can relate to that as a black woman. Um, Mountain Duets uh, by Sophia is a ceremony that calls upon the ancestors and wisdom of Turtle Island to journey through traditional teachings and is a reminder of our deeply rooted strength and resilience to each other into Mother Earth. So I, I'm just gonna ask the question. Uh, this is like a two part question. Uh, and uh, I, I guess I can start with Rochelle. Uh, what are some of the examples of cultural and standardized barriers that you faced in healthcare? Part to this part of the question. The second part of the question is how has cultural and clinical standardization of health impacted your life and your practice? So. Um, yeah, that's. Uh... <laughs> It's like a, a big question, even though it's like everything that my piece is about. Um, I guess I'll start with how it's affected my life because it's also the, what 
inspired me to create my piece. Um, it's effect honestly, it's affected every part of my life. Um, growing up, I dealt with a lot of mental illness. I uh, didn't actually even understand what was going on with me, but I knew something was wrong. And I would go to my family and they would take me to a doctor and the doctor would kind of do nothing <laughs> or uh, do something, but like it was never the right choice. And I, you know, didn't actually get diagnosed with a mental illness until I got to university. And then even then it was attached to my weight and there was a lot of disregard for my feelings. And so to now be someone who lives with uh, chronic illness and uh, borderline personality disorder and um, has limited vision because it took so many doctors uh, so long to just like see me as a person and to actually listen to me. It's really hard for me to think of what other people are going through because I'm like not even the worst situation, you know, like I, <laughs> I, I, like, I don't even know how to quantify my own experiences because I have just so much in my memory of just like um, being not important of, you know, angst of just like being a regular teenager. And then now I'm just like struggling and I'm coming out of it on the other side and trying to live my best life uh, post diagnosis. So it's, it's weird to, um, yeah, I don't know if I answered the questions. <laughs> I feel like when if something is like so a part of your own existence, it's hard to kind of quantify it. Uh, but that. <laughs> okay. So how has that experience impacted the work that you that you're presenting today? Yeah. Okay. So uh, how it's impacted the work I'm presenting today? Um, so or your work overall. So fair. Yeah. Um, Specifically with Queen Latifah, I, this kind of came out of my experience of, I was having severe headaches and I've, I've had headaches ever since I was younger, but these were like really, really, really bad. And, um, I was going to the hospital constantly and they, you know, the first time they gave me IV, they said, oh, this is just stress, take some ibuprofen. Uh, the second time they accused me of, you know, just trying to get drugs. And I was like, no, I'm like, I think I'm dying. Uh, and like after four visits to the hospital, uh, they finally gave me an x-ray, which they really should have done the first time. Uh, and by the fourth time, I was saying that I had vision problems. Uh, I was disregarded. I had to search other places for help. And it wasn't until I had another doctor sign off on my um, experience, like an ophthalmologist sign off on my experience and take their proof, like their x-rays to a hospital that they actually took me seriously. And I was able to get a diagnosis. And right now I have limited vision. I, um, have like I have very like no peripheral vision it's very easy to sneak up on me I can't drive <laughs> um like and it's again like I have it better than a lot of people but it's really hard for me to go through my life with these limitations knowing that they didn't have to happen if I was listened to the first time or the second time yeah great uh I guess Avada could you answer the same question or yeah, I mean, uh, because you shared, you kindly shared the questions earlier, so I was sort of like preparing and I was like thinking about culture barriers. And then one thing that came to my mind was as a diasporic person, as a person of color, whose language, whose culture are so different from the Western, 
one thing that came to my mind was linguistic barriers for sure because uh <clears throat> you know the the fact that like trans on-site translators and interpreters are not available feasible in any kind of uh, medical institutions is very frustrating for a uh, for for a person like me because uh this because like for example i remember uh yeah, there was like this time when I accompanied with uh, one Korean lady whose English was not perfect and I sort of volunteered as an interpreter so that because she had a really big tumor in her brain and we went there together and that was like five years ago and I was not even understand what this, what this doctor was telling her in terms of what kind of treatment she was going to get, what kind of medications she has to take. So that was very a uh, frustrating experience for me. Uh, so this this unapproachable, you know, to have on-site available interpreters and translators is a big barrier in terms of languages and cultures. I think, especially when you think about how multicultural Canada is. And. With this example, that it was uh, this personal experience that I had with this lady, I was trying to use a online dictionary, like use some Google Translator. But uh, the thing was, the, the hospital was located in a very old building, which didn't have any internet available. So that was another level of frustration as well. So I think uh, besides to these linguistic barriers, the lack of the resources and the lack of uh, like universal needs such as internet and Wi-Fi is also very important. And uh, in addition to this linguistic barrier, like I wanted to sort of see a psychiatrist for my anxiety disorder, but I was always finding myself hesitating because I was not sure about my English even my French, because I've lived in Montreal for a while. And, you know, when it comes to psychiatric treatment, verbal communication is the foremost methodology for its diagnosis. So that's why I sort of cut off myself from seeing therapists. And then, and then that's how I sort of got into just test myself using online available, like, uh, anxiety test available online and actually this experience was my trigger to produce the work presented at the festival called intolerance of uncertainty because um, I so that was like two years ago and I did the severity of my anxiety using the four standard anxiety test available online called GAD7 ISU12 and then I just successfully like tested my anxiety. And then after all, what I thought was those standard tests were, have been developed and practiced only for the Western people and by the Western people. And that's how I sort of linked this aspect reality to the idea of post-colonization and imperialism as well as clinical standardization as well. Because uh, uh, although I was okay with like testing in the first place, I my doubt and fear about not believing in this test was growing bigger. So uh, with this for this work, uh, video installation, there is a text work called Instruction to the Ball Measure, which I sort of dismantled the four standard anxiety tests into something very non-rational, non non-logical and abstract point of view. And I approached it, the writing practice as a sort of way of decolonization. And that's, since then I have, pro I have been producing work uh, that sort of subvert something, some like very conventional methodologies developed and practiced by the Western into something hybrid form of the Western and non-Western. Oh, interesting. Yeah. 
Great. Uh, then, Lisa, could you answer the same question or should I repeat it? Um, could you repeat it? Just Okay. You know. <laughs> I, I kind of figured. Uh, okay. It's a two-part question. Um, what are some examples of cultural and standardized barriers have you faced in healthcare? And also, how has cultural and clinical standardization of health impacted your life and your practice? Uh, thank you. So, yeah, I guess um, as someone who has been out as queer for like the last, oh God, I don't know, 11 or 12 years, and then I've been out as trans for the last uh, three or four, the major barriers that I've faced have been, have come from a lack of knowledge of, uh, uh, you know, queerness in the medical field. I think about how homosexuality was, uh, like the DSM dropped homosexuality as a, as a mental illness just in like 1987. And then they uh, got rid of transgender as a mental illness in 2013, which is super recent. Um, so I think, you know, like some barriers I think about are, uh, my doctor, for an example, told me for the longest time I didn't need to get a pap smear because I was only um, uh, sleeping with uh, assigned female at birth people. And, uh, you know, how uh, when I began my, my therapy for my mental illness, I was referred to a lot of cis straight doctors or, or psychiatrists that uh, I guess just weren't really familiar with dealing with patients with this sort of alternative lifestyle. Um, so it was really difficult to open up and feel comfortable in um, these settings where I, I really needed help. And I think that in a lot of my therapy sessions, more harm was done than any good. I'm really lucky now I found a, a trans identified therapist, so that's all good, but it took me a very, very long time to find one. Um, and even down to like, you know, hormone replacement therapy, I, I can't, um, I have a hell of a time getting, uh, supplies for that at pharmacists and stuff. And a lot of the times, uh, you know, pharmacies and the pharmacists that work there don't even really know what I need. Like I have to come in and tell them exactly. And yeah, like I would say nine out of 10 times, they don't even have the supplies I'm looking for, for this stuff. Um, so it's, it, there's these barriers where I feel, I still feel very unseen by um, the medical field. Um, and yeah, and so I, I find that's been difficult, especially, you know, coming out and feeling comfortable and trying to own and, and really grasp my identity when it feels like the resources that I have that are supposed to be there to be helping me aren't really validating in any ways. Um, and yeah, so I guess the second part to that question, how it's uh, affected my life and, and my practice in particular, um, I really discovered my trans identity through drag and doing drag performance. And um, that was kind of my own way of, yeah, just owning that identity and saying, you know, like, fuck you, like, this is what <laughs> it is. And like, you know, I can be who I need to be on stage and show and, and show everyone that. And, um, and with this piece in this rendezvous with Madness Festival, actually, this is my first installation piece I've worked on. I usually do performance. Um, so this one was a little more earnest. And I guess, yeah, it, it really, I made the first video that's shown, um, way before I even considered transness to be a part of my identity. And I was still identifying as cis female. Right. Um, so it was now with all this knowledge about who, who I am and I, now that I, I, I'm starting to understand my identity more, it was very uh, interesting to go back and sort of explore moments in the video that I copied now, like 11 months into HRT. And um, yeah, and just realize how, you know, how much, how far I've come in terms of really um, getting a handle on myself, but also how, how much I had to do that on my own and how much I kind of had to fight and, 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 and look for 
this kind of help and the kind of help that I needed on my own. Yeah, awesome, yeah. amazing. Um, Sophia, could you answer the same question? Yes, of course. Um, I suppose it's, it's quite similar to echoes a lot of what everyone's been talking about. Um, I had many odd run-ins with the Western medical um, practices, I suppose. Uh, just recently, I'm realizing, not recently, but one of the kind of craziest ones in 2016, I had three fairly severe concussions within six months um, and just complete, after the third one, complete blackout for about 10 months um, where I had a team of 10 doctors that just basically trying to reestablish who I was and how I was as a human being. Um, but in that time, the reason the other two concussions happened was because the first two, or the first one wasn't treated properly and the second one wasn't treated properly and the third one wasn't really treated properly either. I was kind of tossed around in this team of 10 doctors that I talk about. I was, I was the point person somehow. Um, I had no short or long-term memory at that point. So I had some roommates helping me with notes, but there was no connection, no communication between doctors and just kind of bounced around various hospitals, various ther therapy sessions, various everything. Um, and in the moment it was, I was just trying to exist and survive. Uh, <laughs> stepping out of that really, um, made it very clear to me about all the previous experience I'd had with the medical system um, and how it was kind of the same. That was just a macro scale of, of everything else that had happened. And that happens on the regular basis. And similar to what Rochelle was saying, I'm not anywhere close to the worst. Like there's so much craziness. Um, within that time frame, but right before and just after, I was really starting to tap in and learn about my indigenous lineage. Um, I was adopted at birth, so I was not raised by any means in my traditions. Um, so it's been a huge journey and path of coming to terms with that. And as I started to kind of regain consciousness over the 10 months after my concussions, I was really curious about, well, how did my ancestors heal? How did, how do the people of this land heal? And I turned to a number of options. And I mean, culturally in the hospital, um, I do not look or present as part indigenous whatsoever, I'm very white. But then same thing within certain indigenous communities. Um, I, I don't present that as either. So there's kind of also this argument and this ongoing battle of, well, you're not white enough, but you're not indigenous enough. And where do you find your traditional medicine? Where do you find your traditional healing and your grounding? Um, and so it came from a number of different areas and teachings and places. Um, I work with a traditional medicine woman now um, quite closely. And um, one of the biggest things that's not just in my case, but for this country as a whole, is we've completely lost a lot of our traditional medicine practices, which is my, a huge frustration. So one of the, one of the books that we've been working through right now is um, about herbology of North America. And in the book, it has all the descriptions, plant descriptions, you medical uses, what the original uses were from, when they were lost. And then it has a whole little paragraph um, that compares North America to Russia because Russia still uses all their traditional plants in their hospitals. Um, and so my biggest questions, I guess, right now is where did that go and how do we bring that back? And what is my role in that as somebody who is still very much working with the struggles of the concussions and the illnesses that follow and the, the chaos. <laughs> I mean, everything is chaos, but, um, and how do we help remember this, this tradition? Because in a lot of indigenous communities, that knowledge and that wisdom is lost. It's gone um, through colonization, through everything. And how as a person who doesn't look super indigenous and who wasn't raised in the traditions, but is now completely immersed and working and doing my best to live them, um, how do I act as a bridge to help with this knowledge and help bring it forward and help bring it back um, so that people who are in my position or in any position that are here that live on Turtle Island can access these traditions. Because if you live on this land, there's a good chance that this land is gonna help you with no matter what, right. what medical stance you're in. 
um, that's kind of a bit of a roundabout answer. <laughs> um, in terms of my, the impact on my work right now, um, I mean, my current, I'm currently using my movement practice um, as a way of both understanding my roots and working through my healing, um, as well as helping others through their healing. Um, yeah, my Mount Duets itself is based on, not um, explicitly, but in terms of our entire process is based on the medicine wheel. Uh, we're working on the traditional teachings of that and using it as a choreographic tool. Um, yeah, I was trained significantly, very harshly in all Western dance forms. So ballet, jazz, lyrical, modern, hip hop, tap, point, you name it, we did it. Um, and then I, I found, I learned about colon, uh, colonialization and, or colonization, sorry, and everything. And spent a year just trying to rip all these Western dance forms out of my body and realized that that ripping is also hella traumatic. Um, so I'm at a point now where I'm kind of working with, okay, how do I use all these ingrained forms that are in my skeleton and in my bones to, as a language and as a vehicle to understand my roots um, and understand the roots of, of the ancestral land um, and my ancestors and the ancestors of everywhere here. Awesome. Uh, the next question I, wanted, I was going to ask was how can uh, to you, Sophie, um, how can uh, cultural barriers to healthcare be overcome? But my experience with the healthcare system as a black mad female, I found that as an elder and a frontline activist, my healing came through community. So my faith in the healthcare system is very, very, very small. So is, how's your experience with, uh, as, as far as community versus healthcare system? It's exactly what you experienced. Um, traditionally, that's how people healed. They healed in community. They had medicine people in their communities. Um, they worked with the medicine people, but the medicine people brought in the community, they called in the circle, everything the Western medical system is very linear and very time-based and very just cut. Um, yeah. And in the indigenous communities, everything is in a circle. It's all based on this, the medicine wheel is a circle. The seven grandfather teachings move in a circle. Yes, yes, yes. Um, it's the same kind of thing as it takes, a, it takes a village to raise a child. Well, it takes a village for anybody to heal. To heal. It's yes. not all on one person and it's not all on that person to do their own healing either. Right. Um, it's up to everybody. Okay, um, thank you. Same question to Rochelle. Uh, as a frontline activist and a part of Black Lives Matter, and looking at uh, healthcare as, uh, to, uh, specifically to uh, Black people, Black women, uh, and focusing on the same question community versus the healthcare, uh, how do you relate to that? Can yeah. Um yeah, absolutely. Like community is so important and it's the thing that kind of helps us survive uh, the medical industry. Um, as, a, as a Black woman, as a queer woman, as, you know, all of my other parts and, you know, even just sitting here having, you know, been the first one to speak, uh, I feel like, you know, in relation to like myself, my history with the medical uh, industry and answering your questions, it was like me navigating shame and then listening to the other panelists and you talking so freely. And I know like, I, I, I mean, I don't know, but like I know that that's something that even you're dealing with, like navigating your own shame that you've, you know, has been put on you by the medical industry. Um, and how we've almost developed a community here because that's the thing that connects us. It's, it's so strange how, like it, <laughs> the medical industry is supposed to protect us and keep us safe. And yet it's almost formed a, uh, this thing that we have to fight against and we have to fear and, and 
what's both depressing and beautiful is that it creates community in those that it rejects because we have to come together to like fight through all of those things. And I think that's also what my piece is about is just this really kind of the sadness in that desire and that need to become strong to have to depend on others who didn't ask for it, to have to uh, like have to speak up for yourself and you can't just go in alone because sometimes people don't have community. Sometimes, you know, you're immigrating from another place. Sometimes you, you know, your, your mental illness uh, makes it like really hard for you to develop community, to integrate with other people. And so you go to the doctor alone and you're walking in there with fear and doctors take advantage of that. So I am so blessed um, whenever I find community, whenever there's people I can talk to and say, oh my gosh, I had this really hard situation, what can I do? And they're the ones who provide me with answers because nine times out of 10, it's not a doctor who gives me the answer. It's, you know, part someone from my community who tells me how to navigate the system to heal myself or to get better. Um, but it always makes me really concerned for those who don't have a community, who don't have a family or, you know, somebody on the outside. And so they're literally depending on the system that's been created that's supposed to help us. Um, and I think that's also what uh, you mentioned Black Lives Matter. I think that's also what Black Lives Matter is talking about. They're a community who's trying to say the system needs to fix itself yeah. so that Black Lives Matter doesn't need to be the news, doesn't need to be the place where people can find the truth uh, so that we can depend on um, our doctors, so that we can depend on I mean, I don't want to say the police because, no. <laughs> <laughs> but like depend on a system that's in place to keep us safe, yes. you know? And right now the police are not the system that's in place. We need a new system. Mm -hmm. And just like the doctors, perhaps we need a new system there. New um, yeah, so that's, that's my relationship with like community. And, and while it's beautiful and wonderful, it's, almost sad that it's a requirement. Yeah, true. Yeah. Awesome. Van, would you like to answer the same question? Yeah, um, so just echoing what's been said, a similar thing is uh, relying on community, um, especially just to educate myself on and what's happening with me um, has been a huge thing. Social media in this time um, too has been a really big help because I feel, you know, whenever I have a question or something, it's way easier for me to just post it on Instagram and get um, trans identified individuals answering me than trying to get through to doctors and being misgendered and dead named in the process, you know? Um, so yeah, just community has been absolutely vital in uh, my transition and my, my own therapy. Awesome. Avita. Yeah, talking about the importance of communities is, you know, like it's definitely one of the things I've been struggling with in Canada as a diaspora person. Like, I think, especially when you come from the outside of this culture, somewhere like really random place, like me, like from, I'm from South Korea, you, without communities, you can easily think, I think you can easily think your culture is wrong when you trying to integrate into this culture, when you're trying to, you know, be in the melting pot in this culture and language and all. So that's the one thing that communities can encourage people whose cultures, whose languages are different to just keep on their culture as well, to think that their culture, my culture is not wrong. And, uh, one of the other importance of having communities, belonging to communities is also, you know, within communities, you can exchange resources for sure. 
Like, for example, because the idea, the notion of family doctor is super different in Korea. Only the rich people can afford family doctors. Whereas that's one thing that I've found out by living here, because uh, when you got a like student visa or PR visa, PR uh, confirmation letter, there's no sentence that describes like detailed procedure of having family doctor or you need to like even like say that you need to have a family doctor. So I spent like almost four years not knowing that I have to have family doctor, which is very actually could be risky and dangerous while living here. So I learned that not from like, I didn't, I was not informed by the government or the city of Montreal. I was informed by in the communities. So that's the one of the very important you know, resources that you can get from communities. And yeah, I mean, like also, I think in terms of talking about communities and having more uh, to boost the importance of communities more within the uh, medical industries, I think this can be also done like by the increase of uh, em employment rate of people who are more diverse in terms of races or genders, every, you know, in every aspect. So that like, if I go to a hospital and if there are like more Korean born and raised doctors, then I'll feel they must be, they might be part of my community as well. And I'll ease my fear for sure. Yeah. So yeah, so representation is very important, yes. Yeah. Okay, um, just checking the time here. Uh, I wanted to uh, talk about another question. We all talk about COVID-19 as artists and how it's impacting your work. Um, for, for, just a, for me as an older artist who already, as an older black man artist who already experienced various obstacles during normal times, so right now, COVID-19 has really slapped me in the face. So I wanted to know how it has, it has impacted your work. Uh, Van, you want to like take that one or start it? Sure. Um, yeah, I, it's, for me, it's kind of been, there's been some pros and some cons, right? I, um, this whole Sir Benefit thing has actually allowed me to, live. I was living on, you know, not a whole lot of money before. And it was really, really difficult for me to uh, continue with my arts practice. So in some ways, it's allowed me to take the time that I want um, and actually be able to like feed myself at the same time, which is amazing. Um, but it's also, again, being someone who primarily uh, works in performance, it's been quite the change with everything being online. Um, and that medium has just completely transformed. And to be honest, online is not really something I'm super interested in. Um, so it's, yeah, it's giving me a minute to pause and uh, rethink, you know, my place in, in um, this sphere. And yeah, I guess that's all I kind of want to say about that. <laughs> okay, um, okay. Uh, Rochelle, what do you, you have anything to add? Uh, yeah, um, I feel like COVID-19 uh, <laughs> is kind of like the terrible, be careful what you wish for. Because uh, <laughs> like, you know, as, 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 a, as a mad, uh, black woman, I'm always like, I just want time to pause. I just want to have the time to catch up. And then COVID happened and I was like, oh my gosh, there's sort of my money. I can like catch up and I like started going ham. Like I was like a, like a, I don't even know. I was just like making a website, doing the thing and like, <laughs> yeah, I got this. And then, you know, it was COVID and it was horrible. <laughs> And so, yeah, I feel like I'm like coming out the other side of it now, just being like, I can't do this anymore. It has to be over. Why did I do this to myself and to everyone? Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> like, 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 there's been 
it's good to have like time and I've done a lot of like cool things and you know I'm, I'm playing with jewelry and doing more visual art and I made a film and that's cool but like you know I, I miss I miss an empty theater I know that sounds strange but like I miss a full theater don't get me wrong but like I miss being a director and like sitting in a theater before the play starts and just being like haha like I just miss that moment and I don't know, I would like, I would be very happy for the world to come back so I can just like have that time. Um, I miss like the connection of like collective creation. I miss performance. I miss so many things. So like, while it's great to have this time to like, you know, build up myself as an artist, um, I think it's, it's not worth the trade. Okay. Yeah, awesome. yeah. Sophie, what do you have to say about COVID-19? <laughs> um, I mean, I pretty much, the first 80 days of the lockdown, <laughs> same, same life as that Van and Rochelle just talked about, like, I didn't, like, that's a biography of what I did, um, to an extent. Um, yeah, I mean, a direct impact seven gigs and festivals were canceled. Um, my piece even now um, in the last four weeks went from five dancers to one dancer. <laughs> um, and just for safety reasons, I totally, as part of our contracts is in my choreographic practice, if I'm hiring dancers or if I'm performing myself, it's whatever you're safe with. Like if you don't feel safe, you're not out of the project, you're not. Right. Penalized, you're not gonna lose your honorary, like whatever you're safest with. But that does also leave me on the stage by myself. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, honestly, I'm not somebody who stops very often, and so it was very nice to have a steady day where, for the first eighty days, get up at eight or nine, work out, walk down to the beach and read my book for three hours, walk back, work out do the same thing, <laughs> um, similar to what Van said. Like, I don't think I've made $2,000 a month in three years <laughs> and I work five to seven jobs. <laughs> so um, that was really nice. Um, and then I actually, one of the most grounding things that happened is, um, I don't, I don't, I'm not really on much, I'm just on Facebook, I'm not really on any social media, but just the energy and the chaos and the, the collective trauma yeah. that's finally emerging from the world just started taking hits on my energy. So with my medicine woman, I ran away from the city for 12 weeks um, and built a fully impermanent sustainable community on a piece of sacred yeah. land up north. And I lived off grid for 12 weeks until we got hit by a tornado. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the tornado reminded us of everything that's out there. So then we came yeah. back and then also this festival. Um, but yeah, so I mean, that was actually very grounding and that's my number one um i'm in a phase right now of my husband and i are putting together workshops to address the collective trauma that the world is in i won't go right. down that rabbit hole too far but um yeah the number one thing that i learned this summer is just just go be outside <laughs> i mean i do that every summer but not to that not to that extent um the nature awesome um avila would you like to add to it yeah i think uh, my status was a bit different from all of the rest of people because uh, I very lightly got a PR, which means since uh, because I applied PR last like last April in 2019 and because of COVID-19, my application was postponed, got delayed. And so that's why I had to, I were, I was just holding a visitor visa to be here for like almost one year. <laughs> which means I was not allowed to get CERB. So that was really a really hard and frustrating, uh, you know, like reality for me as a visitor. Right. But uh, my partner, like I was able to survive because my partner kindly and thankfully shared his CERB with me. Yeah, so uh, that was, I think uh, with this COVID-19, the reality has shown more and emerged more who's really in a, the most precarious situation. So that's the one thing I experienced myself also learned. And uh, like since last March, since the lockdown, 
since I don't have to work or I'm not allowed to work, I'm not allowed to get started. So I've spent, been spending a lot of time in my uh, room, which was very fine for me at first. And then like, I, because I was always fascinated by images of hands. Right. And then this is like my ongoing work. Like I, you know, observed people utilize, start to utilize their hands differently. Like thinking that hands are really, you know, have become some vessels that is, that is infectious and contagious and dangerous. Right. Whereas like hands were the representative image, you know, used to be a representative images of, uh, you know, like the pleasure of touch and tactility. So that's how I observed. So I've been writing like uh, 50 instructions, aiming to write 400 instructions since until uh, COVID-19 is resolved. <laughs> so these instructions like are very short sentences that tells the audience how to ease your anxiety on your hands. Yeah. Oh. So, yeah, that has been really fun, interesting practice for me. Cool. Okay. Before, well, we're looking at the time here before they click me off. Uh, one last question from my, from me is, um, what messages do you have to leave to the viewers about your work, about your practice? Uh, you, Rochelle, you can go for, start with you, if you like. Um, <laughs> what messages I would like to leave? Um, I would like to leave the message that Things are hard a lot and people will surprise you and uh, to consider your privilege, to consider your space, to think about how, you know, the world around you exists, um, to think about the possibilities in just everything that you come into contact with. Um, you know, whether that's the possibilities of, you know, just looking at a flower and, and, you know, being inspired by that or walking into a space and like actually really considering how it makes you feel. But, you know, more importantly, to think about how each space would make somebody else feel. Um, to really consider, you know, your position as you know, an ally and somebody with privilege to actively, you know, whether you're someone who is a visible minority or not, to first think about how you are privileged and how you can help other people, you know, and then think about how, you know, you're vulnerable and consider how those things are balanced out. And think about how you can change the world and how we can all survive this COVID, but mostly just the world. How are we gonna survive the world? Uh, yeah, I think that's, I think that's what I wanna leave people with in general. Okay, okay, awesome. Uh, quickly, Sophie, you have anything to add to that? Just... Yeah, that summed it up very nicely. Um, I'd say just carry, carry the circle with you. Um, we live in a, we live in a circular world. Um, we live in a circular everything. No matter what, at, at some point you're gonna be out of balance um, and the circle is there to bring us back into balance. It's, um, it reminds us of reciprocity. It reminds us of our strength and resilience as a people, as a race, we're, we are the most resilient of anything other than nature itself, um, which can teach us that as well. Um, so just come back to that, come back to the roots, go back to nature, um, and just find what you can to carry with you to always have that kind of shining little resilient light right. there with you. Awesome. I don't know how, how I, but I haven't heard from the timer yet, so let's go continue. Uh, Van, would you like to add a last little thing for the viewers? Yeah, um, I guess I would just like to add, um, for my piece, like, things do get better but things also as they get better they can get 
a lot trickier and a lot harder and um you just have to trust yourself and listen to yourself because you know best um yeah <laughs> Adina. yeah i uh like resonating to everything that has been said i really want to encourage uh, the audience to support and like search some information that can support like the group of people who are left behind from the you know like legal social protections so there is a there is a long movement and a like a yeah, movement and protest called social status for all which was like started in montreal so if you can find the information and support even just uh, liking it would be really helpful i think yeah, awesome Awesome, thank you. Uh, just going to uh, go back to Jessica. Jessica, are there uh, questions from the viewers? Yeah, I know that we only have three minutes left, and so um, I'd love to... Sorry about that, it was just a... <laughs> no, I don't want to interrupt. I think there's been a lot of compliments from viewers about how wonderful this um, panel has been. So I'll ask this one question that someone um, had, and uh, whoever is willing to answer it in a nice succinct way if possible uh, please uh, feel free to do so um, so um, this person asked would the panelists share some examples of success in making cynics or ignoramuses more empathetic at least more open-minded we have a volunteer <laughs> would anyone like to uh, respond no 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 Okay. I, I'm just trying to find the definition of cynics. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone have any anecdotes for um, providing more s uh, examples of how, how uh, one can help people become empathetic, um, win people over through conversation and sweeps or? <laughs> I feel, I feel like I don't really have any like actual examples, but like I also feel like I remember just like looking someone deep in their eyes and just like getting really like, you know, really like earnest and and and, and just being like, please, like think about somebody who's not you. And like, maybe that worked. You know, I think <laughs> I think maybe if you approach people like humans, uh, yeah. as much as you know, it might really hurt to do so sometimes change can happen uh but yeah i mean at the end of the day i try to be as honest as possible and as authentic as possible and try to give the person the benefit of the doubt for as long as i can until i have to run away uh yeah that's kind of all i got <laughs> <laughs> um i guess in a sense too i might pop in on that um i try to find stories that resonate with people storytelling is a huge component of all culture across the entire world um and so i'll i'll sit there's a there's a um a traditional teaching that's walk with me um ewapone um and so i will put myself in the position of walking with somebody hearing where they're coming from and find those little segments and i do the same thing and um i practice traditional time massage i think as mentioned briefly at the beginning any client that i have walk into the room like i sit down and i work with their healing story so that they become engaged and they are not just there for a massage. They're there with intention and they're there to heal. And I think that that's totally translatable in all of our arts practices and all of our everything, whether it's a mental health conversation, whether it's a healing conversation. Um, yeah. Storytelling. <laughs> All right, I see our time is up, right, Jessica? Right. Um, thanks so much for the, that, those anecdotes, uh, Rochelle. I just want to say, uh, I just want to thank the panelists for. And thanks for having me. Oh, thank you. And um, I, as promised, you know, I can fit in like one more minute. If any, if everyone wants to just go around and tell us uh, how we can connect with you, uh, let's do that, please. Let's start with Rochelle. Okay. So you want to do that? Uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, my piece is Queen Latifah, Give Me Strength. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram and with 
the handle at Rochelle Richer. It just ends at AR and then nothing more. Uh, or you can find me on Facebook at Rochelle the Artist. I think that's what I did. Rochelle Richardson the Artist. You can like, uh, you, it's my face. Like it's very, you know, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm around. Oh, I also have a website, RochelleRichardson.com. Sophie, you want to go next? Sure. Um, I have Facebook, uh, Sophie Dow. Uh, I have an email address, uh, sophie.c.d at hotmail.com. Uh, and I have a Winnipeg phone number that you can email me for. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and a mailing address. Um, yeah. I like to talk, but like if you'd like to talk, I love talking to people in person um, or on the phone is the best way to do it. Um, so yeah, let's have a conversation. Van Lisa, how can we keep in touch with you? All right, so you can keep in touch with me mainly through Instagram. My Instagram handle is my drag king name right now. It's <laughs> be changing soon, but at the moment I just put it in the chat. It's X Prince Johnny X. All right, sounds yeah. good. Avida. Yeah, you can find me Ivara Kang on Instagram or my website ivarakang.com and then the Instagram you can also be linked to like my Facebook and the website. Yeah, and my email as well. So I'll be really happy if like someone contact me to keep, you know, this conversation over these topics. Yeah, also I really thank for Gloria and every participating artist and Jessica, Chris, Don, Rodrigo, everyone. Yeah, thank you. And you can contact me through Instagram. It's uh, Gloria underscore C underscore Swain underscore artist. Or you can just Google Gloria C. Swain. So That's you great. guys are amazing. Thank you for uh, having me here. So thank you. Yeah, thanks all around. Thank you viewers for joining us. Our festival goes on until October 27th. Lots of amazing events. All pay what you wish. Uh, take good care of yourselves and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye.